So Weird Tales magazine began publication in 1923, and it is an interesting publication indeed that has had an on again, off again history, but whose classic period was essentially the 20s and 30s. And Weird Tales magazine was the publication that brought authors like H.P. Lovecraft to light to the masses. But there were many other writers who were prominent in this magazine, among them names like Robert E. Howard and Clark Ashton Smith and Seabury Quinn, and perhaps all too infrequently, this strange figure, Nixon Dialis. Nixon Willstone Dialis might have been born in Massachusetts, probably in 1873, but maybe 1878 or 1880. He was a chemist as well as a writer of science fiction and fantasy stories, but he had a very scarce degree of output. There were eight stories published in Weird Tales from 1925 to 1940 or so, with few also showing up in Adventure and Ghost Story magazines. All in all, it seems like maybe he published about 15 stories. And very little is known about him because he seems to have kept his privacy very closely guarded. And there's even reason to question the authenticity of things like his name, his birthplace, Elspray de Cop, who was a frequent biographer of fellow writers, maintained that his name was indeed authentic. But other evidence points to it perhaps being more prosaic along lines of Fred Dallas, for example, along with the fact that Nickton himself seemed to have enjoyed a little deception and playing around with common spellings and proper names as evidenced in the story that we're coming to. For Very instance. much, yes. Yes. And there's conflicting information around his family, his birth, his marriage, residence, and only the most prosaic details really seem to be verifiable. He seemed to have married twice. His first wife was committed to a hospital in 1928 where she spent the rest of her life apparently unaware that her husband had moved on and remarried. But he declared himself to be a widower. And his second wife was recorded in the census as Netuliani, which is obviously fake. Her real name was apparently Mary Shetty. And... They both submitted fraudulent social security applications that misrepresented information like birthplaces and names. So yeah. I don't know. Like it's it's really hard to say what's true because yeah. he seems to have wanted to hide everything about yeah. himself. So, Makes you wonder what they were up to. Yeah, uh, 1925. This story was written, and this story and a few of his other early stories would be classifiable as science fiction. It seems that. He was most fond of writing tales of occult mystery, spiritualism, and astral journeys. And reincarnation is a major theme in his works. All in all, he didn't publish much, but for some reason, his stories were always anticipated in weird tales. And although they have not really been collected too much in print since, possibly only recently so, in fact, together in one place, his stories definitely were met with some positive commentary at the time of their publication. So this is a science fiction story, and this is definitely something different than everything else that we've done so far. This is very blatantly a pulp sci-fi yeah. awesome space opera kind of thing, and it's just so good. Yeah. Even though there are some writing things that I think were not great, and I think we agreed on that. Yeah, I mean, I will just say it right out front. I mean, I said it earlier that Lovecraft gets a lot of flack for having a awkward and clunky prose style. The prose here is really awkward and clunky and very juvenile sounding. But even with that aside, there's some awesome stuff here. Yeah, this this is great. Yeah, so Ron T is a scientist on the planet Venice. It's a world containing an advanced civilization. And... There's a bunch of learned Venetians in assembling in Ron T's workshop, including the first 
person narrator and who's an archivist or a record keeper called Hack Erie. And unfortunately, the names are a bit hack inducing yeah. for this whole story. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how else to say it. Like, they make it a little bit weird sometimes. You think that things should be read and they should be able to be said aloud. And you're like, kind of, what people make fun of science fiction for a lot of the time is this kind of stuff. Yeah. I think you were talking about that when we were talking about Out of the Silent Planet. A little bit, yeah. It really comes into play here. I, I think more so in this than, than that. Definitely, definitely. Now, there there is one way I can explain away some of it, but I'll get to that. But Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, that, that way will be pretty obvious shortly. So all the planets that are mentioned in this story, which are all the planets of the solar system discovered until that time. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they don't include Pluto. We've downgraded that. That's not a planet in the solar system anymore. So, <laughs> But they have devices for recording all the sounds and sights anywhere on any planet. But Roti has got a special one, and it can tune in anywhere. So they listen to Mercury, and there's cool, mad, uproarious sounds from Mercury, and they listen to some of the other planets. But Earth, spelled A-E-R-T-H, silence. And they call this place the Green Star. It has dimmed in recent years. They have contact with every other planet in the solar system. They're all inhabited. And the thing that's introduced here, which I think is really cool and ahead of its time, is this whole idea of, like, there's a solar federation. Yeah. Of all the other inhabited planets, they don't hang out that much. They have their own things going on, and they kind of agree to just, like, let each other be. But if they need to... They can congress, and they will get something done. So, obviously, things like that, they would be seen much more later on in science fiction works. Yeah, this element reminded me of the Dog's Monster Plan and uh, uh, Doctor yeah. Who serial. But also Star Trek. Yeah, right. <laughs> and the Federation. But, of course, like the Dalek Master Plan, this one doesn't include humans. Right. They are the silent planet. <laughs> so... There is a worry about what would happen if Earth broke up somehow and Mercuria might fall into the sun. And we know what that really is. So they decide that a group of seven Venetians will go and see what's up in the Aether Torp, which is a spaceship shaped like a torpedo, I guess. Yeah. And their captain is Holjock. And they arrive in orbit of the earth and they see desolation everywhere they land in a valley and there's a river and nothing seems fertile it seems very dry and they come across these giant protoplasmic organisms these giant blobs with mouths yeah. and teeth <laughs> great sci-fi monster yeah yeah but luckily they have their blast doors yeah <laughs> Spelled with O-R, not E-R. O-R, yeah, it's so good. But I don't know, in a couple of places, not necessarily 100% like I need to believe everything you say, but it does seem like this might be one of, if not the first instance of the use of the word blaster yeah. to refer to like a ray gun. Yeah, right. And that's pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. I don't remember, like even, even Buck Rogers wasn't a thing yet, right? So yeah. like... So the blasters are effective in disintegrating the blob things, but they figure out that the organisms, of which there seem to be a considerable number, they'll pretty much eat anything that they throw at them, and they blast every one that they see. But there's foreshadowing about more powerful blob things. And they go wandering, and they hear huge, indescribable, agonizing sounds. It's so terrible. <laughs> it's great. And what's this? Civilization of some sort. Amorphous beings. Horrible and maddening to behold. And then, behind those creatures, in a troop, they see actual Earthons, or human beings. Very degraded. Spent-looking. Very slavish. Obviously, 
a species that's been conquered and overrun. And that's not good at all. And they stand on a shelf of rock and these huge blobs on the ground start emitting horrible sounds from their mouths. And it's like the Mayhars in... Yeah. Yeah, from At the Earth's Core. That's pretty much exactly what this reminded me of is At the Earth's Core. Yeah. But, man, the blobs are such a cooler <laughs> monster. Yeah, this was actually more, like, horrific-seeming. Yeah. Kind of, in a way. I don't know, the, the blobs are like this deathless alien entity. I mean, they shoot them with a blaster and it blows them to pieces, but they, they just reconstitute themselves. They can't get rid of them. Yeah. They come from a different dimension. Yeah. The amorphous beings that are, like, shape-shifting all the time, right? Yeah. As opposed to the solid protoplasm blobs that are just hanging out on the Earth. Yeah. These guys are, like, shape-shifting monsters, and they have no souls. The Venetians sort of can tell this right away, and their blasters have no effect. They don't even notice. They don't even notice because they come from a completely different plane of existence. But they're described as being beings of low-level intelligence. And now, the crew has to confront the evil intelligences. So they project this magnetic pull that attempts to draw the crew towards them. Again, very Mayharish. But the captain thunders, In the name of the looped cross, stand fast! And suddenly, the intelligences seem ridiculous, and they all start laughing. And it turns out they can be punched in the face. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Again, very Burroughs. But it also reminded me of Star Trek. It already yeah, reminded right. me uh, right. of that episode with the Klingon guy that's on board the Enterprise. And there's this being that's attempting to, like, foment fear between the Klingon and the Federation people. And William Shatner gets to be all William Shatner over the top. And he's telling this Klingon commander, he's like... We have to realize the ridiculousness of the situation. We have to laugh. And and so they do. And that, like, the alien can't stand that. It's, yeah. It's, it's like, yeah. <laughs> now, so, around their ship, the Aether Torp gather these evil beings and their earthling slaves with swords. And unfortunately, the latter must be blasted away into oblivion. It's a real pity. But Earthlings are really being done a favor because this is a really shitty existence. We feel good for them. At least the characters feel good for them, so I guess we do too. So the captain breaks some trees and makes clubs. Mighty, mighty clubs. And they storm their own ship and drive away all but one of the evil amorphous things which they imprison and dominate. And they learn that the things are from the dark side of the moon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Earthling says uh, they have an Earthling sort of captive, but he's not really a captive. Like, they treat him nicely because he's been enslaved and he seems to get on with them pretty well. But he sort of explains what's been happening. But he thinks that the amorphous ones come from hell. And they these things came from hell because human beings develop this way to create an endless supply of gold and they did some weird alchemy and they opened the portal to the other dimension and the evil things from the dark side of the moon came through and it was terrible apparently gold has really mysterious properties that just don't know about. <laughs> yeah yeah i love it it's yeah. it's, it's it's great <laughs> seriously great yeah it is so the ship starts being tracked by like these globular lightning projector things and luckily the material that their spaceship is made out of is lightning resistant and so they prime the act blasters which are the super blasters that are like more powerful than the regular blasters and they destroy the globes that are projecting the deadly lightning and the captain decides that they must clean up the earth and also that they must make better blasters so that they can deal with these amorphous horrors. And they have this one, uh, they start calling them the Lunarians, and they have one to experiment on after all this. 
so they can vivisect him and do all kinds of terrible things to him and see what chemical processes perhaps make him suffer most. And they get nothing much from a Lunarian in terms of communication. He certainly doesn't talk to them. But from the Earthling, whose name, it turns out, is John, they learn quite a bit. And that's when he explains the the source of the like what happened with the human race and how they their greed and so on led the moon people to find them in the worst way possible. And they've been enslaved and treated horribly for so long. He's not gone into that much though. Which is a pity. Yeah. And they're home now and they're not really doing much but talking, but it's kinda cool because they have this like interplanetary council which is you know it, it's he talks about the various denizens of the solar system and the differences between them and the the huge jupiterians and the uh yeah this part was know, really cool the martians and yeah. uh and then you know i mean the names the names are a little bit of a pain but it sort of helps i think to think okay so this story is written for earthlings so it's written in a way that's like, it's not necessarily the Venetians write their name or call themselves that or anything. This is a corruption of what we know of as Earth speech. Yeah. So it's like, it's not really that. At first I was kind of annoyed by that, I guess, just because it seemed silly uh, um, <laughs> in a way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but when I thought about it like that, like, okay, so... This is just how the names have been corrupted over time. This is what we call them on Earth. So that's what they're writing. And that makes sense. I mean, they could just make up a word. Or they could call it A-E-R-T-H. <laughs> For some yeah. reason. right? So Ron T, the scientist, does all these experiments on the Lunarian. But one day his lover shows up to try to make him feel a little better. Because he's been pretty glum lately, I guess. And she plays music on this stringed instrument and the beautiful sound causes the Lunarian the most intense agony. The thing is essentially discordant and shrivels at harmony. I wonder what Craig would have to say about all yeah, that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But a fleet goes to the Earth and they are equipped with giant loudspeakers. And they play music. And they play the most harmonious music. Very, very loudly. Makes you wonder what it is. Yes. <laughs> and they make the Lunarians feel very miserable because they hate harmony. And the Lunarians launch defensive lightning globes, but they are blasted asunder. And the music continues. And suddenly these really old, they're still called ether torps, yeah, spaceships blast up from the earth and they try to get away and there's a space battle our first example of anything like a space battle and i think still a pretty early example of like that kind of thing just ships hanging out in space shooting lasers at one another right and this is a pretty clever maneuver they pull too i mean this yeah. is definitely something that Picard or Cisco would pull off in a Star Trek episode. You know? <laughs> yeah, and it was written in 1925. Yeah. So the music goes on, and it can be heard in the ships of the Lunarians, too. And finally, the ships are blasted away from the atmosphere, and in outer space, their forms dissipate. And again, it's stated that these beings have no souls. So it's more than okay to kill them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so Earth will rejuvenate itself and rise again. And that is pretty much the end of the story. So yeah. the Federation people, I guess, are going to help Earth from henceforth. Yeah, seems that way. It seems that way. The uh, final destruction of the Lunarians was pretty cool as yeah. they kind of tricked them into this like vacuum space. And they congeal into one solid mass. And when they're blasted by the disruptors, they have nowhere to reconstitute themselves. So they're just like eventually wiped out. And that makes sense because they have no souls and they're like yeah. just this undifferentiated, horrible thing. And it's okay to like vivisect them 
because they're like that. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, this was the story that I was talking about at the beginning where it'd be really cool if the Tornadres author had written something like this. Like, the plot in this and the this crazy imagery of alchemical experiments gone wrong opening up these interdimensional portals from the dark side of the moon leading these horrible blob creatures coming through that can't be destroyed except by clever tricks by an interplanetary federation yeah man if, if it was written in that kind of poetic prose style that really conveys a lot of the feelings and atmosphere in a more effective way not to say that this was ineffective at that it's just a lot of the prose in this was really like clunky and juvenile and there's like a lot of exclamation points and i, I guess that kind of goes along with the territory of more pulpy stuff but it's one of those things where the plot is so cool and so out there that if it was done by a different author that had a i guess more literary touch it would be like one of the top novels of all time for me. Plot in yeah. here is just like in, insanely cool, <laughs> especially for how early it is. I think, yeah, I, I think the earliness of it is significant, and I, I do think that you're right. I mean, it's a little bit more surface oriented than some things that would come. Yeah. Where you'd be like, and you see a lot of stories like that, even in the 30s and 40s and beyond. Where oh, sure. It's like, yeah. It never really goes away. I mean, you look at a movie like, I don't know. Independence Day, for instance, and the, the, the aliens are just unrepentantly, like, evil, and they have to be destroyed, and it makes sense. That's, that's part of the narrative of these kind of stories, but, yeah, I mean, and there's the whole being that negatively affected by musical harmony is strange and kind of funny, yeah, but kind of cool, too, exactly. I guess, in a way. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> It's like you could just play really awesome music at them and they'll shrivel up. Yeah, I mean, it, as you alluded to earlier, the way Lindsay did it in Arcturus was awesome. And I, I think with a more talented writer, he could have really made that like cooler than it was, even, even though it was already pretty cool. You know what I mean? It's just like, I think with a different prose style, it could have elevated this to like an all-time top novel. Yeah. And in a way, pulp stuff can be frustrating in the fact that it is oriented towards a more juvenile audience and they're really trying to sell copies rather than maybe make the best art possible and sometimes it's fine but uh, other times it does want me wishing there was more there yeah i think that the story and stories like this were starting to become prevalent around this time but this was probably one of the first of its type and yeah just a few years later we would see authors like edmund hamilton who I sort of just recently become a little bit acquainted with, but he wrote many, many stories in a sort of a space opera mold, starting in like 1929 and going through the 30s and 40s. He married another science fiction writer, Lee Brackett, who definitely wrote a lot of similar things in what would be called planetary, uh, what do they call it? Planetary romance or something like that. And it was, yeah, this story definitely felt like a precursor to a lot of things but it also had some of that lovecraft style sort of weirdness oh absolutely yeah and you know like i read a, in a couple of sources recently including in the big book of science fiction that and that i didn't really agree with actually that hamilton could have been an influence on lovecraft in certain ways and like although i'm sure lovecraft was aware of it and read him and stuff I just don't know, like, by the time it was 1929, Lovecraft was already writing, like, full-on into his whole stint with the old ones and the weird tentacled amorphous beings and stuff like that. Oh, and, sure, yeah, yeah. And stories like this, too, 1925, yeah, that is, though, pretty early. And it's, of course, paired with the whole, like, really science fiction motif with the, the crew of military men on the spaceship. And they even have, like, a bit of a jocular relationship with the captain and the other guy and like the archivist who's going on about stuff and the, the captain is kind of like do you want me to throw you out of the airlock and it's, it's really yeah we're seeing the birth here of the grizzled space military explorer that 
would become so popular and prevalent as the genre grows up and goes and, through its sort of boyhood adventure stage. Yeah, uh, and pretty quickly afterwards, too. I mean, 1930s, like Flash Gordon and stuff like that. Yeah, no, this is early on, uh, 1925. We are covering some space opera stuff from around the same time, I guess, later on. Yeah. But I haven't read either of those titles, so I'm not exactly sure how much they play into it. So there is a bit of a religious or at least semi-religious character to some of this, too, which I thought was kind of interesting. With them being able to see their souls rising and stuff. Yeah. And the fact that they don't, they, these other beings don't have that. Unlike, I suppose, every being in the solar system, which has this visible soul aspect to it that's very tangible and very, like, I think it's sort of in line with some weird pseudo-spiritual, like, science fiction kind of takes from around that time oh yeah and even the place where they're from the dark side of the moon it's maybe one of the few places in the solar system where the sunlight literally never shines yeah yeah that's that's definitely significant because they dwell in darkness yeah so what do you what do you think the venetians look like i don't know i mean I, when i first started the story and they spelled the name venus as V-E-N-H-E-Z. I initially yeah. thought it was from some, like, I don't know, interstellar or some star far away, that this is like some fantasy world, like, star psi or whatever, but quickly on you realize that it's just a corruption of Venus and Mercury and Earth when they start going into the other planets. They're each given a characteristic or two, yeah. which is about as much as you can expect from a story like of this like then of this magnitude right and I, I i thought that was cool the martian civilization seems to be like romantic i don't know i i kind of got the impression that the venetians were like reptiles but like it just seemed to me like the way they talked about their size and the teeth at one point like they just said they had a weird reference to teeth where it was like i would bite that person like it was just it just seemed uh, it was cool. It was like, yeah, I, I feel like the Venetians seemed like they were large reptiles. Yeah, like their civilization seems kind of romantic, like they have minstrels and warrior castes and stuff. And there's various descriptions of the, the solar system council. And yeah, usually it's only a few words because this is a short story. And I guess we're not really going to get into the federation of the solar, the solar system. Yet. Right. But there is a sequel to this. The Oath of Whole Jock. So, and yeah, that was the, the captain of the ship. So I guess it's, I don't know. I, I would be curious to read that. But Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if this really needs a sequel, but no, I certainly really. wouldn't mind another very weird story like this. A lot of the time in these kind of publications, like when it's a sequel, it's really just the same characters in a different situation. Right. Like that's, yeah. so that that way you could pick up the magazine and just read that story and you won't be like, oh, I missed a whole bunch of stuff from the previous story. Like, that sucks. Right. And you don't want that to happen. So I think that's part of the reason why these characters were so popular. And you still see that now. But, like, these characters, like the psychic detectives and the characters like Sherlock Holmes and Professor Challenger and Superman, even, and all these recurring characters where when you see them symbolically appear you know what to expect and you know what kind of story it's going to be. Right, exactly, yeah. So uh, I wonder what the call to the devour blobs sounded like. <laughs> he tried to describe that and it was like, obviously meant to be unpleasant, but he likes harmony. He doesn't like discord, so... <laughs> yeah. 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 He does go into the music of the Venetians a bit as well. So music definitely plays a part in this story. I think this would be definitely redolent of a lot of... Oh, one thing we didn't mention, which was a, a parodic take on this concept, was Mars Attacks. Yeah, I haven't seen that <laughs> one in a while, but... Um... Yeah, the records at the yodeling that like brings down the Martians. Oh. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's just funny the way it's done. But I actually, every time I've seen that movie, it actually gets better. Yeah, it's been a while like since I watched it. The first time I watched it when I was in my teens, and I was like, oh, you know, that seems really disrespectful to awesome old movies and stuff, and I don't really get it. And every time I've watched it, I've just been like, oh, wow, they let all these 
big name stars die such ignominious deaths <laughs> yeah. and it's so funny and it's like it's so irreverent and the soundtrack is the score of the movie is like made specifically to annoy people uh, it sounds correct. like oh it's like weird synthesizer warbling and stuff and it's just uh such a nice tribute to yeah. old i mean i know it's based on trading cards but i don't actually know anything about that and it just comes across to me like a really honest parody of almost like these kind of stories that started in the pulp magazines around this time but 30 years later you would see in films in 1950s by people like ed wood oh absolutely yeah i mean by then it was pretty much an industry yeah yeah and some of them were actually good i'm a big fan of some of these movies like it the terror from beyond space that movie's great and there are other examples like the crawling eye and <laughs> xd unknown yes yes and they're really really awesome yeah and the concepts are just as they're, they're they're kind of touching the alien and the strange, but they don't really go all the way in certain aspects, maybe. In this story, though, I don't know. It's strange because this story was written in 1925, and it was definitely a very early example of this kind of space opera, and it just seems like we've been doing stories up to 1920 to this point. I think that our tourists... No, sorry, we did... Um, out of the silent planet which was from the yeah. 30s but other than that we really haven't done anything post 1920 and it just seems like this story was a really sudden leap forward like it yeah seems i mean like... there's definitely some elements here that you can piece back to earlier stories like yeah the idea of a crew going through space and doing heroic stuff you can see in a lot of the Jules Verne knockoffs of sure. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea that are in like all the Edison aids and things like that. There's also the element of like really weird alien type creatures, which we've seen in some of the other stories in this episode, though not necessarily in a blob yeah. format. But the combination of all of them together and this idea of this like interplanetary federation and alliance between everybody who are presumably different species yeah not just like one contiguous colonization yeah, he does he does go into that a bit he yeah. describes he describes some of the different species uh, right as much as he can in, in such a short format yeah yeah and it, it does feel like quite a bit forward than some of the stuff from even 10 years prior yes i don't know this story although not being perhaps the best written tale, did make me want to read more science fiction in this vein. Oh, yeah. And made me want to... And I, I just love the whole people wandering around through space discovering weird life or things. And I think we'll be covering a lot more things like that as we go on through this adventure. Yeah, definitely. And, I mean, the, the pro style here for me is more or less a nitpick. I mean, I thought this was great. <laughs> You yeah, know, it really works as a story. Ray guns and monsters and <laughs> weird uh, interplanetary stuff. Yes. And although Weird Tales was largely known for fantasy, I mean, what would become sort of known as fantasy yeah. and stuff, they did cross over a lot into weird science fiction territory. And people like Clark Ashton Smith and Lovecraft definitely, especially in the 30s started to really merge these things together and i think that people like dialis probably inspired that a lot because i mean in 1925 lovecraft was definitely he had already written some stories that suggested science fictional elements but he was definitely still in his like everything is frightening phase and everything is like terrible and there are things that i cannot really describe and <laughs> all that stuff that he's always made fun of for which he actually bypassed by the end of his life yeah like his last stories are not really like that and i don't think anybody can criticize him for that and it even seems like he got over a lot of his xenophobia that's kind of my impression anyway yeah that's what i've heard too uh, for, especially for people who have read through some of his letters and correspondence yeah yeah the lines between science fiction fantasy and horror especially this early on really blurred together and i mean even today there is a lot of crossover between 
the genres. Right, and we love the sci-fi horror movies. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. But all those things were present in this story. Yeah. To an extent. I mean, the fantasy, yeah, maybe a little bit. Like, it seemed like there was some weird... It was probably the most undercooked part of the story, but this whole weird, like, spiritual side to things that suggested there was a, a literal hell almost and that right uh, on the dark side yeah. of the moon <laughs> yeah yeah and and the whole thing with the souls flying up and stuff and yeah and none of that stuff was really explored so i think that was very undercooked but there was just so much cool i enjoyed reading through it it went very fast oh yeah and it was engrossing and i wanted to see what would happen next and unlike some stories of its contemporary vintage and place, I did feel like the people of the spaceship were in danger at times. Granted, they were the heroes, but I did feel like at times things were serious enough that they might not get out. And not long afterwards, by 1931-32, Clark Ashton Smith was writing some of his stories, like his Martian stories, where usually the characters didn't really get out alive. Right, yeah. So, I mean, and, and anything could have happened at that point. And so I was not sure it would go the way it did. And in a way, like, that made it less horror because they just got away and they had a Lunarian to experiment on. And so they were able to figure out what their weakness was. And it was a little bit pat. But I mean, still, just them encountering this unimaginable... Yeah presence and they have these incredibly powerful energy weapons and they don't do a thing and they're uh, observing yeah, these was, was... like solar system wide events of something so horrible happening to the planet beyond these blobs enslaving whatever humans are on there but yeah darkening the hue of the light that emits where it's visible on the instruments of this interplanetary council just to be able to do that you know it suggests a really strong and otherworldly force that scares people that are capable of interplanetary travel and capable of doing things that are far beyond the reaches of the audience that was reading the stories yeah yeah uh, that was definitely one of the coolest things about this was feeling how it was clearly influencing so much of what was to come, but also delving into this weird sort of spooky territory. I liked the, the blobs and the amorphous beings that were so horrible that they were always changing a shape yeah. as soon as you caught a glimpse of them. And they have no souls, which is funny because I would almost think a being that was like that might be more... I don't know, like more fundamentally creative than a static being, but I don't know. Maybe that's just my imagination. Me being esoteric and strange. I went along with it for the story. So yeah, it definitely <laughs> works. It definitely works. Yeah. Yeah. So apparently the most of his other stories are more along the lines of mystery, occult detective kind of weird reincarnation, which seems to be a regular theme of his comes up often in his stories but i don't think that aside from perhaps one or two other stories he returns to this much of a sort of very plain science fiction base i'll take a look at the other stories and see because i want to know and and i am also interested in reading that other side of him yeah and a writer who is definitely a sort of a hidden name and not much known about him, and not much known about what kind of person he really was. Some obvious dissembling going on, which is sort of hilarious. Yeah. And, and great, almost. Just just how there seems uh, <laughs> conflicting information about all that. But yeah. that's okay. I don't, personally am not that bothered with discussing the personal lives of the people that write some of this stuff. I just want the stories. And yeah. This is certainly a great one, that's for sure. Well, this has been quite a journey, and we have traveled, we've visited magazines in England and America, and spent a little bit of time in Spain and France, and talked about ten stories, many of which were very cool. Oh, yeah. And good. Yeah. I enjoyed all of them to some degree. Yeah. We recommend that you read most, if not all of these, and 
you can listen to this episode and draw your own conclusions. I mean, it's pretty obvious which ones we were fans of, but I think that I liked all of them at least to some degree also. And yep. some of them were perfect, but that's the way that these things go. And that's another reason to love short stories because you don't have to put up with an author's imperfections for that long if they are really there. Next time, I think we will be doing, well, we're actually going to do a bonus episode where we are going to talk about a lot of the things that we've done so far. We did one of these before episode seven, the automaton episode, and we've done a fair amount of fiction since then. So I think that it's time to sort of just relax and revisit everything and run down some pointed favorites and ideas about what might have moved us in particular and why and talk about our plans for the future of the chrononauts podcast yep because we certainly have a lot of those plans yes we have a lot of episodes plans uh a really high number actually yeah <laughs> and we will be getting to a lot of cool stuff but it's going to take time because we want to really explore and delve as much as we possibly can so when we come back after the bonus episode our next real proper theme will be aviation yes back when it was science fiction and not science reality that's right so a and powered flight while it seems to us commonplace now has only existed in the last hundred or so years but in the 19th century and before people have always thought about flying so next time we're going to be doing Herman Long's The Air Battle, which seems to be a extremely obscure novel. Nothing is known about the author, though it's almost guaranteed to be a pseudonym, so we're going to have another authorship mystery to dive in there. More well-known is H.G. Wells' The War on the Air. And in addition yes. to those two novels, we're going to do another reading of Hans Christian Andersen's In a Thousand Years. We've been having a lot of fun producing these, so we hope you have a good time listening to them as well. Yeah, and there will be a second episode around this theme as well, but we all get to that after we do the first one. And I'm really looking forward to it. So where can everybody find us? You can find us on Facebook at Chrononauts Podcast. You can also find us at Twitter at Chrononauts SF. And we have a number of texts and translations posted on our blog spot at chrononautspodcast.blogspot.com. All right. And thank you very much for listening. And this has been a really great journey. I've enjoyed this very much. A lot of this was fun. The stories were fun. Talking about them were fun. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. stay tuned for the bonus episode where we'll chill in even more and just talking about everything that we've been discussing from episode one on again and our feelings about all the things that we've tackled since then. And uh, we might do a list or two as well. So thanks for tuning in. This has been Chrononauts. And we hope that you all have a safe and interesting journey. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.